to play the game. The genesis of our participation in Saw 4, it was an audition and it was a contest. And the only rules we knew were contest rules. Last time we had been in that scenario was with Feast, and it was us versus, I think, 1,500 other screenplays. So you go in not to take your best shot, but your, your best 100 shots. We knew that there was going to be something called Saw 4, and that was pretty much all we had to go on. In fact, the one disadvantage that turned out to be an advantage was we were the only team that just didn't get this email that had the Saw Bible, which these are the rules you're going to follow. Well, keep in mind, that happened like as we were entering our pitch. So we walked in, and they're like, so you got, you know, you're going to incorporate all the things you talked about? And we were like, uh, what? what? <laughs> uh, we'd seen three, mm -hmm. and then there were things that uh, they wanted to continue. We didn't have any of that, so we just sort of were flying blind a little bit. And so when we went in and pitched, we had these giant post-its uh, that you put up on the wall and then you know saw four, saw five, saw six and it was like way too much shingled, information. Shingled with ideas. It was like an hour and a half presentation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the traditional sequel paints if you know can paint you into a corner but if you knew there needed to be a payoff after a payoff after a payoff great you can you can attack it with foresight not hindsight. Uh, saw five was a reaction to a reaction to Saw 4. Simplify with 5. Simplify, simplify, simplify. So then when that came out, well, guess what? It was too simple. Where's the haha? -ha? Great. Well, that opened the door again, so 6 could point to the stands and Kevin could hit it out of the park. Kevin Greider, he directed it and he, he edited all the movies. So he, if someone else knows the canon as well as us at that time, is probably him. You know, let's try to bring in Shawnee and, and then let's make it more Tobin's story, making him active because the problem when your character dies two movies ago is that inevitably they're coming back to flashbacks and that can be rather passive right tobin has a stack knee high of these handwritten tablets where he's broken down john kramer and he's broken down jigsaw and he finds a different angle on a philosophy and it makes all the difference in the world that's the substance amongst all this violence well he was such a prevalent entity. I mean, it was tapes, it was flashbacks, it was his story, and uh, it, it, Kevin tied a masterful bow on what it was to be John Kramer, not just the jigsaw. You think it's the living that will have ultimate judgment over you, because the dead will have no claim over your soul. When Six was being produced, there was an element of maybe the villain does die in the Springtrap, so there, there was a version to be shot where Costas didn't get out of that head trap. At the after party for Saw 6, Ryan Turk came up to me and said, Saw 6 was so good it made me hate 5 even more. And I was like, oh wow, that's a great comment. I remember I had a red wall and, and it was like seven cones of red paint and then we'd shingle it with all these cards and there was a special post-it for history and twistery. That was Saw. And it was like, okay, unanswered elements. Boom, 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 boom. It looked like a Richter scale going up and down. And it's like, we can tie this into this element and give a payoff here. The first Paranormal first took half our business off of Saw 6. The studio was freaking out thinking it was like, there was some, some underlying reason of why audience suddenly didn't want to see it. And, but and, but the, the reason was very clear. It's as well because there was another movie that was opening that was like suddenly really popular and everyone thought they had to see it. And so all of a sudden, what was intended to be a Saw 7, a Saw 8, and maybe even a 9, had to just be, all right, we're loading all the barrels and we're just gonna fire this one last shot. Do you have what it takes to help her? Make your choice. We had to take this story that was supposed to span two movies and then suddenly put it into one. Uh, our initial plan was to write and do it back to back. So, cause it's 3D and so it's more complicated and longer. So just to shoot two movies, but we just did one and that was the end of it. They wanted and they said a million dollar opening that took place outside in a public area, blah, blah, blah. My original idea was to put it on top of this giant building and it was like this uh, tug of war essentially, whoever lost would fall over the edge. The traps that, I, uh, that appealed to me very early on was like the Rube, Go Rube Goldbergian sort of like nature to them. Domino effect that pretty much destroyed the entire street. The car we saw earlier takes the turn and hits the policeman. The policeman falls over and his gun goes off and it's like so it was like, I mean, it, mm -hmm. this is like a huge elaborate. It was a million dollars. <laughs> it was a million bucks. People see that and they're like, well, that's a little big, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it just gets whittled down to what it was. The voices from that that series, you know, they're, they're always fresh, you know? And you, you're hip deep in that for four or five years. Yeah, they still pay a visit from time to time. Next time someone cuts you off in traffic, you, you might think of a, an appropriate recourse for that.